Welcome everybody to our men's club meeting. Uh, I know most of our guys have resumed. Uh, they came up from setting up for the breakfast and lunch for uh, the Super Sunday festivities downstairs. And uh, we'll be getting to that later and thanking them more later. For those that don't know me, I'm Don Weisenstein and I am the president of the men's club. Do we have any new members present? Anybody new members? <laughs> No new members? What about guests? Any guests? Dave, would you? Alice from Centennial Mill, who were my guests this morning. Our guests. Nina, say hello. Come to the day yourself. Oh, really? 15 seconds. I can't get it out for 15 seconds. Resident of Centennial Mill. Worked for a transportation company. Dave is an old friend. Not so old. None of us are really old. But, uh, just thought I'd find out a little bit about uh, Men's Club. I've always heard a lot of good things about it, and I'm just interested in finding out more. Right. And your name again was? Joel Hammond. Joel. Okay. Anybody else? Joel, if we could ask you then uh, just to meet, uh, lead us at Hamotzi, and then we'll be able to start a breakfast. We'll, you start it, we'll get it going for you, too. Baruch HaTor Anoi, Eloheinu Melech Alam, Hamotzi Lechem Min Oras. Joy breakfast. First of all, I'd like to thank all of those guys, and I'll ask you to kind of stand up, that were involved with setting up not only our breakfast up here, but all of the Super Sunday uh, activities down there. Uh, first, I'll ask if you were involved with that at all, please stand up. Thank you so much for your energy. And, and I must say, Bob did just an outstanding job of coordinating and organizing everything. It ain't over yet. It's not over yet, but you know, when he's handling something, it, it's great. And one of the things I've said over and over again is that, you know, I'm tr I try as the president to coordinate things, but you know, the reality is that you know as well as I do. I'm just here because you need a pretty face. Yes. So these are the guys that are really getting the things done for us, Sometimes and we really do appreciate it. And Bob is now outstanding in the snow. <laughs> outstanding in the snow. I'd also like to welcome, I see some of our softball players and fellow <laughs> colleagues there. It's great to see you guys, and I'm looking forward to uh, I'm in training already, as you can see. It's just, it's just well camouflaged. <laughs> and I'm going to ask uh, Ed to help uh, Lo and Marty on the next part here. First, uh, Ed, if you give us an update on, on dues and things, and we have some things to go over as far as handing out our shirts. Well, we're up to 70 paid members. If there's anybody here today who hasn't paid, I would love to have your money. Uh, and if you won't admit to it, I'll catch you. <laughs> um, so hopefully when we get our softball members in, which should be shortly, I guess, um, we'll probably be around 80. We kind of projected 85, so uh, go out and recruit some friends. Bring them along in the mornings and show them what, what a great time we have uh, once a month. That's about uh, it, I guess. Um, the, we have a new dues structure. Oh, okay. Um, All right. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> in the past, we used to have it where the dues was $42 and you got a free breakfast. Quite honestly, it's a real pain for the treasurer to worry about who has gotten their free breakfast, who has owed it, and the board decided we're eliminating that. We're just going to clean it up. We're going to eliminate it. So now new members, when you join, it's $42. And you get a South Jersey Men's Club shirt and South Jersey Men's Club name tag. That's going to be included with the $42. It's really critical that many of you are wearing the shirts already. We need to establish our identity. We do a lot of good things when we're downstairs later on today. It's good that other people see there's an organized group that is involved helping the Jewish community. So by giving you the shirts, we're asking, please, wear them. You can wear them outside of 
a South Jersey Men's Club organization activity, or we certainly want you to wear them to our meetings. We never know. Somebody might see 30 or 40 or 50 guys wearing a shirt saying, hey, what's going on there? Maybe that's something I want to get involved with. And these are our softball uniforms. And these are also our softball uniforms. Uh, you could probably still see some stain marks. That I tried to hide with my name tag, but that's, that's OK. It looks like a lot of mud. <laughs> a lot of mud. <laughs> but you know, we really need to help sell ourselves and let, it, let people know we are an organized group trying to better the Jewish community. So with that, I want to ask uh, Ed and Marty to help me quickly. If you're a paid member, we want to distribute your shirt. We have 20, I think. Barry, is it 20? Barry, it was 20, right? 19. 19. We have I'm, I'm sorry, we have 20 shirts. They 20 shirts to today. If you're a paid member, you got it right now. For those that don't, we'll reorder and we'll have them for you next meeting. So I'll ask Ed to, because you have the list, and Marty said he'll, he'll help. And I'll ask them to do that here towards the side. So as they call you up, if you'll grab your shirt. In addition, we also have new name tags being made. Updated ones that Jerry Emder is doing for us. So, you know, we're trying to improve our, we're trying to improve our looks. <laughs> Whew. Don, should we wear our shirts for days? I'm sorry? Should we wear our shirts for days? Um, I think so, yeah. Yeah, any? Let's wear yeah. our shirts for many Why not? You know, any, any of our activities, let's wear the shirts. <laughs> Uh, I'd also like to thank the 5050 volunteers over here, Barry and Steve, for uh, collecting those that money. We'll let you know after we after we find out who won, whether we find Okay. <laughs> and Nelson, I saw Nelson here. Nelson did complete an audit for us that the board is currently reviewing, and we really appreciate Nelson your time and effort in helping us uh, with that audit. We really appreciate it. Uh, as far as membership, Dick. Or not other. I was going to say stand up and you were standing up. <laughs> <laughs> I know I, I know I've shrunk. He's taller than Sherlock. He's taller than Sherlock. Well, I, all I can tell you is that the laziest guy when it comes to doing the survey. So uh, Don was nice enough to propose to get on. There's still more than that. I have retained services at no cost. Uh, no, I've retained the service. David Wynn and I are going to get together and we're going to complete the survey thanks to him. He's always been very inst instrumental in, in trying to find out what we're all about and what kind of new services or activities that we're looking to do. And uh, I'm sorry? How many responses have you received some total? I have. Don't remember the responses. Uh, no, I have not added that up either. <laughs> so we, we got 27, I think, was the last analysis we got. Right. We have 80 members. Yeah, well, I think I have about, about we have about a, that sounds good. We have about a, that's why I hired David Wynn at no cost to the, uh, uh, to the men's club to help me with this survey. So we, at least we make some sense out of what we're doing and what services uh, we want to add. And if anybody, by the way, if anybody hasn't done their survey form, please let me know, and I'll be happy to give you a form so you can fill it out. Uh, is, was there any new members here today? I don't think. Did we have one one gentleman? Did one gentleman, get up. The guy in the Joel. Joel. Hi. Did you join yet, Joel? I have not joined yet. Okay, make just sure one. I have uh, plenty of applications. I'll make sure you get at least two. Well, there you go. Three games. <laughs> And uh, anything else uh, that no, I need to report on other than? Okay, thanks, Don. Thank you. In a board meeting, we also uh, decided we need to review our, unfortunate bereavement and mitzvah card policy. Uh, Dave was nice enough to do a first draft for us of the policy. The board has uh, just cursory re uh, reviewed it at this point. 
Anybody that has uh, from the board changes that they would like to suggest, they're, they're going to send it to me. I'll compile it, go over it with Dave, and then we're going to have a second reading. We're trying to formalize things a little bit, have structure, so that people that follow us years later don't have to guess. Everything is written down for them, the procedure, and what to do. Don, just one real quick. I, yeah. um, I had a tough week this past weekend. I just want to thank you. South Jersey Men's Club for their words of support, their friendship. Um, it really did help a lot. And uh, I just thank you again. And to me, this is one another reason why I like to love the South Jersey Men's Club. Thank you for And our thoughts are certainly continue with you. Uh, MAR report. Basically, just to repeat, I'm the. Uh, Representative for the Middle Atlantic region of the Federation of Jewish Men's Clubs, of which this uh, men's club is a member. And uh, so basically, they've asked me to be their liaison with this men's club, which is very easy for me to do because I'm still an active member of the men's club. Uh, it's interesting, uh, some of the men's clubs here uh, uh, exist, but don't have much of, uh, in the way of relationships uh, uh, internally <clears throat> and with the region. One of the problems that we have is that they are, there are criteria for outstanding men's clubs, which we will never be able to meet because we're not a synagogue men's club. Um, for those of you that are fairly new, we used to be a synagogue men's club that went bankrupt, and we petitioned the Federation to continue as a men's club. And the feeling up there was that uh, we're going to drop dead after six months. And we've been one of the most aggressive, uh, productive men's clubs of all. Um, uh, however, there's certain things we can't do. Uh, uh, one of the criteria is that there's a thing called the worldwide wrap, which is to fill in wrapping. Um, and uh, uh, we, we don't do that. We're not the member of a, of a uh, synagogue. So there are criteria we can't meet. We will never be an outstanding men's club under their criteria because of that. However, I believe that we are an outstanding men's club. Um, uh, in, in the areas that are within our area of uh, competence. <clears throat> Don constantly gets uh, material that, the, me that uh, the region wants, and basically they want me to follow up with Don uh, to see what's happening. I know one of the things that Don's going to be bringing up is this uh, training institute that comes, uh, comes up uh, very shortly. Um, the, uh, the reason for that is they would like comparatively new, newer members of the uh, boards to be in there, to be aware of what goes on and what resources are available to them. Um, and I think Don is going to be talking about that and whatever else the, the region wants. So basically, I think the region thinks very highly of us, uh, even though we will never be an outstanding club under their criteria. Thanks, Dave. Rich, anything to report? I know it's early on Yamaha show. Uh, and uh, Barry, do you, you want to mention anything regarding our sports? Um, JAG is always willing to run additional sports other than softball for its uh, members. Uh, the problem is that uh, a lot of these sports are dying on the vine because of a perception that there's a lack of interest. So if there's a particular sport or event any of you are interested in, in the past we've run volleyball, pinochle, uh, softball, basketball, racquetball, uh, and sports like that. If you're interested, please give me a call. And if you think that we can put together a team to participate in one of those sports, I'll bring it up at the next JAG board meeting. Uh, JAG has already met. We met in December. We'll meet again uh, next month to plan for the upcoming spring sports. Uh, JAG is a very vibrant, active organization. Every local synagogue has membership and participates. We're anticipating about 12 softball teams in the JAG Softball League that starts play starting April 1st. Uh, if any of you are interested in uh, trying out for our softball team or playing, uh, we would welcome your participation. If any of you have sons or grandsons who would like to play with us through South Jersey Men's Club, please let me know. If we had about eight or ten additional guys who would be interested in playing, the Men's Club would probably be in a position to sponsor a second team. Uh, we're reluctant to do so until we hit the magic number uh, probably of about 35 to 40 before we'd sponsor a second team. But if we get that kind of interest, we would certainly be willing to 
uh, participate. Uh, thanks again to our softball team members who came out today. It was nice to see them. Uh, you don't see us in March, April, May, June, July, because that's when the softball team is playing and practicing uh, on Sunday mornings. Uh, you had a question? Yeah, what's Mike? Jag mean and who started it? Jewish Athletic Group uh, started by South Jersey Men's Club approximately... 1996. Okay, 1996. So our, our, our small men's club was instrumental in forming a body that every local synagogue in South Jersey uh, could participate in a, in an athletic way uh, with sportsmanship being stressed to provide this type of uh, fraternity through uh, sports participation. And that has been a very, very successful venture. Uh, South Jersey's officers have always been instrumental in the leadership of JAG, uh, and it's an organization that continues to thrive. Sir. Uh, you know, Mike, Mike asked you a very interesting question about who started. I think you're altogether too modest. Dave Lynn started. It's all Dave Lynn's idea back 20 years ago. Well, I think Dave I, think it did. I, uh, I remember <laughs> when we were, I think, at BJBI or something. Some of us said, let's go out and throw a softball. I mean, when we were out there, like five or six of us. And that's evolved to today. And Any plans for a bowling tournament? Um, yes. yes, it's it's, we'll be about it. it's been discussed. I think it was in February last year. So the JAG board should get together in February within about two, three weeks. And uh, Randy will send out an email uh, announcing when the date is. I participated last year. I'd like to do that again. So if, as soon as you get the email, respond back to me, and we'll put together a team. Okay? I'd like to add to what the Barry had to say, because Barry's not aware of some of the things that are going on. At the last board meeting, um, what Barry said came up, uh, the fact that uh, we're getting fewer events being scheduled and fewer attendees at the events. And at that point, uh, I was appointed with uh, somebody, Ron Adams from um, uh, Temple Emanuel, to uh, try and uh, come up with some system for improving that. I have developed a questionnaire, which I sent out to Ron and, uh, and uh, uh, Brian Zuckerman, who's our president, and they, they seem to feel it's, it's OK to go. Um, I've, I know we have our own survey here. If we get data from particularly our athletes, uh, that, that would help because uh, we know some pe uh, people from bowling, pinochle, and so forth, but uh, uh, you know, maybe tennis and other sports, uh, uh, we might need other people who are not quite 80 years old like I am and so forth. Um, but that, sur that survey will be going very shortly to, and I'm going to uh, talk to Brian, uh, the president of the men's clubs in the area. By the way, this is primarily a men's club organization. Uh, uh, Sons of Israel doesn't have a men's club, Ner Tamid doesn't have a men's club, so it's synagogue. Otherwise, it's the men's club. Uh, so we'll be sending it to them, and we also will be sending it through the representatives uh, to, to their men's clubs. As far as specific sports, I've already followed up from the person who was responsible last year. And at the present moment, and these are tentative dates, uh, we will have a uh, tennis tournament on the first weekend in, in uh, March. And we will have a bowling tournament the last weekend in March. When I contacted them, uh, the tennis guy says, oops, yeah, I haven't been doing anything. Uh, how about if I try and do something? And the bowling guy is on the same uh, club that uh, the person who handled this thing last year. He said he would do it too, and he would come up with two bowling tournaments. Uh, one, and this is all tentative until we get the final uh, information in, will be the end of March and sometime in the fall, so we'll get two of those. But I'm still trying to get other sports back in. We had volleyball, which was very big, and we used to win a lot of those tournaments. Uh, we had basketball. That lasted a couple of years, and then the guy who ran it uh, disappeared. Uh, we will do anything, uh, play any sport that uh, you folks want. For example, <clears throat> if we get back, uh, Art was involved in bridge, enough interest in bridge, we can have another bridge tournament. The point being, we can only do what we see there's enough interest, and uh, not only among us, but among other clubs. So this little bit of information's been happening uh, in the last uh, month, Barry. Okay. Is that kind of thing we can do? Right.
Um, Don, Don and his son played softball with us last season, and uh, they, they, they had a ball. They were great additions, and it was gratifying to see our men's club president play because he got to experience firsthand uh, the, the great aspects of this softball league and the great contacts that you make. So, Don, we were glad to have you and your son, and hopefully you'll play again. And the last hit I had last year, I'm, I'm still trying to get to first base. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, uh, the guys are great putting up, <coughs> putting up with me. <coughs> Excuse me. Putting up with me uh, trying to, to play, but uh, I, I really do enjoy it. It's great being back. And really, although it's not tied to, I guess, MAR, but related to sports, again, we're certainly interested in anybody who wants to join. We did start this year a fantasy football league, and there were eight or ten guys involved with it. We had a blast. We're certainly going to do it again next year. And uh, if you're interested, just be watching for that or let me know. We're certainly more than willing to add teams. And you want me to expand the question to include the fantasy football I don't see why not. Okay. We could certainly do that. It's another fun activity, and you know, there's no cost to, this, to the group, so um, we had a lot of fun with it. There's a leadership training conference February 9th. I'm considering going. Uh, I've been doing these type of things for a long time, but uh, I would, if the weather permits, I still might attend. If anybody out here is interested in, in going, please let me know and we could, you know, probably go together. And by the way, just looking out over the audience now, it's great seeing the shirts on it. Really, it really looks impressive. It really does. Thanks, Mike. <laughs> okay, Ed, a JCRC report? Uh, the JCRC uh, board meeting was canceled to, because of snow. Uh, but I'm also representing the men's club at the, uh, it's not really the Super Sunday uh, program, they call it the campaign cabinet, but a large part of that is what we're doing today. And as a, uh, as a reflection of how we're regarded by the, the Federation really, for years there was food available for Super Sunday, but I don't know how they ran it, but Bob Greenberg got a call early this year, he want, they wanted us to run it, and that's why we were downstairs. So as a, a testimony to our uh, esteem by the Federation, they used us. We're going to be doing it again, of course, for uh, Mideast Conference. I'm um, hopeful we'll all wear our shirts for those who are going to be running the breakfast for Mideast Conference. So uh, thank you again for your uh, leadership on that, Bob. What's the date? For Mideast? 23rd. 23rd. Uh, February 23rd. 23rd. Oh. No, February 23rd. And lastly, with regard to Super Sunday, My wife was a teacher. She told me just to stand there and stare. <laughs> the other side of that, throw something at him. Um, there's going to be a follow-up to Super Sunday. For those of you who are willing to man the phones, if you ask any of the people running the program downstairs, uh, they're going to be a, uh, there's a program for running the phones during the week. There's food available if you choose to participate. So of course I'll you know I'll be doing that during the week as well. So I hope you'll join me. And you want to mention about the reading books? Oh, okay. Uh, we also have a book exchange and a uh, music CD exchange. So there are some books available here for anybody who chooses to uh, take them. Next meetings, if you want to bring books, bring music. It's a really nice uh, program that we're running. Bob, would you want to mention anything further on Super Sunday and uh, MEI? Uh, first of all, I want to again thank all the guys who showed up this morning. We literally had the breakfast out by 8.30. We had everything prepared for, for the lunch to go out at it by quarter after nine. It was wonderful. You guys really did a super job. Uh, everything, everything is out there. I was down there. For those, for those who said there should be bagels out there, they, we put bagels out there. So, so, so the, the kvetches are still kvetching. But anyway, uh, what we'll need is after the meeting, we'll need some people to go downstairs and help us put the trays out, which have the tomatoes, the lettuce, and the salads. And that's the lunch. And then our involvement 
is basically done except for Dave Singer, who uh, was gracious enough to volunteer to pick up the dinner over at, uh, uh, at uh, Betty the Caterer on Monday. And that will hold them through next week, because they, they will be soliciting all through the week. Um, as far as MEI goes, MEI uh, is the 23rd of February. Basically, we have two shifts. The first shift is the uh, kitchen shift between 6 and 6.30. And if you want to help me set up the room, we start at about 7.30. Uh, just so that everybody is clear, you must be at the JCC helping out by 8 in the morning in order to get the reduced admission. We get a reduced admission. Yes. It's $45 at the door otherwise. Okay, we're paying 18 Okay? Other than that, um, that, that, that's about it. And I, again, I really do thank the guys who helped out this morning. It was, uh, it was very interesting dealing with people who have no idea what organization means. <laughs> And those who've worked with the, with the various JCC uh, uh, or Federation operations know exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> Again, thank you guys. And just a reminder on that MEI, that's in place of our regular meeting. Okay, so encourage you to intent, attend the MEI, and that's in place of our regular meeting. Art, would you want to mention anything on the investment club? We'll have an investment club meeting immediately following the conclusion of this meeting. Great. And uh, also on the shirts, again, the, the, the club paid for your shirts. Um, again, please wear them. Uh, what the club is not paying for is for, for you to wash them. So please, <laughs> if they need washing, that, that's on you. Okay, Dave, would you like to introduce our speaker? Our speaker this morning is Rich, uh, Rabbi Richard Address from Accor Shalom. We're delighted to have you here today. Thank you for coming. The topic is In Search of Life's Third, uh, I got that wrong, In Search of Life's Third Stage for Meaning and Third Stage. I'm sorry. Uh, he, he had all kinds of wonderful ideas. This being a boomer kind of group, uh, we decided that would be best, and I welcome Richard Address. All right, good morning, everyone, and it's nice to see you. And uh, it's nice to see several members of the congregation here as well. Um, my uh, job with you uh, for the next couple of minutes is to really try to try out some ideas on you. Um, so let me start with the uh, uh, blatant commercial plug and get that out of the way. Um, most of my work outside the, the congregation and for 33 years uh, when I worked and ran the programs for the, the um, Union for Reform Judaism in North America uh, dealt with the development of programs for congregations, our 900 congregations in North America, around issues of families. And part of that was the development of uh, uh, the Sacred Aging Project, which I still work on uh, a, a lot and which I will continue to, to, to work on uh, after June when I leave uh, the congregation. But the shameless publicity plug, and I'll be honest, a shame, this is a shameless plug, so don't write nasty letters to the president or whatever. Um, yeah, well, we'll see. Um, in the back, there's um, some cards for the website that, uh, is, that we started several years ago, specifically called uh, jewishsacredaging.com. And it really is the only site in the country that really is attempting to deal with Jewish texts and approaches to what everybody in this room is dealing with. Uh, and that is our own process of growing older and what that means in the contemporary uh, Jewish world and the contemporary American society. Uh, the other shameless plug is for the radio show, uh, Boomer Generation Radio, which is on WWDB every Tuesday morning at 10. And so there's the shameless plug. Here's what I'd like to do, uh, just to throw out some ideas in these, in these next couple of moments. Um, playing around, and some of the people at McCor have heard little bits and pieces of this, um, but this is something that continues to, to be of concern uh, in the work that I do, both in the congregation and the pastoral counseling world, 
in the teaching that I do at our seminary in New York City, um, and in the traveling I do and speaking around the country on issues of um, our own aging. And specifically, I want to focus on what it means for us as men, because um, there has been a real dearth of investigations and communication and conversation about what it means to us as we grow older and continue to deal with a lot of the pressures uh, that families put on us and that in many ways we put on ourselves. Uh, this week reminded me a lot of this, this whole issue of nostalgia, uh, which is a neighborhood that many of us play in. Um, they, the, according to the news, and they have no reason to lie most of the time, the, um, <laughs> and you probably saw this, uh, this, is, this last week was the, uh, the, the 30th anniversary of the, the, of the birth of the Mac, uh, the iMac, the, 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 the computer thingy. Um, and when you, they had pictures, they had pictures of the old, for those of you who remember the old original, it was 16 and a half pounds, it's about this big, and you need, remember the floppies and you, you, you the floppy thingies and disks, to make that clear. Um, all right, that didn't go over well. <laughs> well thank you very much. You can er erase, yeah, erase that from the tape. Um, and the weird thing about it is in 30 years, all that stuff that the Mac was supposedly able to do, you can now do on this. Um, which is kind of weird, but kind of frightening, because uh, I have no idea what it does now anyway. I have one at home. Um, the other thing is that next week um, is the 50th anniversary <laughs> of the Beatles coming to America and, and being on Ed Sullivan. I, how many, I, I remember seeing this show. I remember seeing this show. And, and I remember my mother, Oliver Shom, watching this on the on TV, I think a, a 30, 50 years, yeah, it was, it was, and just going crazy. I remember my father giving me a lecture, on, you see those people, look at that hair, you know. We still have the same TV, by the way. Yeah, listen, <laughs> don't knock it. That TV is what, that TV now is worth more money than uh, anything else. So, um, what? Right, and the waste up the same way when Elvis Presley was on, they would they were not allowed to show from because God forbid you'd get the wrong idea at eight o'clock on a Sunday night. Um, so that got me thinking. The way I'd like to just begin this is really the, I'm fascinated by the fact we did a whole evening uh, at the congregation on November Friday night, November twenty second, uh, on the fiftieth anniversary of the assassination of Kennedy, which for our generation was uh, we were talking about at the table. Uh, the turning point of our generation. I, 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 you can mark everything that prior to November 22nd, 1963 for, for the first stage boomers uh, was one type of a world. And from that day on, everything else changed. Our lives changed. Um, the war, Vietnam, civil rights, uh, Watergate, all those things and, and much better music and all those things that, that really transformed our generation and really restructured our generation. And all that was 50 years ago. That, that itself is hard to imagine. That it was a half a century ago, that, that, and we remember it. And, and it got me to thinking again about the, po the po po power of memory, which of course in Judaism is extremely important, and the power of nostalgia, and what, what purpose nostalgia serves. Because in many ways it helps us celebrate things. It's also a wonderful filter. Um, in looking back, we sort of like forget a lot of the things that really drove us bonkers. And nostalgia is this wonderful sort of like, we remember just the wonderful things most of the time. Uh, and then the challenge is what we've learned from it and what can we learn from looking backwards so that could we look forward. In the work that I do, in the book that I wrote for, for this uh, issue um, called Secrets of Meaning, it's really an attempt to say, we, we are, we've been given a gift, uh, God willing, of longevity. And this is one of the great spiritual challenges um, that we face. And I, I, I lay this out for you to think about. We ha I have no answers. Uh, if, I had an, if I had the answer, I'd be making a million dollars on Oprah. Um, but the issue confronts every single one of us. This stuff is, is, is not light and airy. It's pretty serious stuff. We've been given the gift, God willing, of time. 
And the spiritual question is, what the hell do we do with it? If we leave full-time work, as many of our contemporaries do, somewhere in their 60s, 62, 65, 69, 70, somewhere in our ages of our 60s, we can expect, as long as our health holds out, even partially, 25 to 30 years more of life. Yeah, halavai, exactly right. And the spiritual question is, what are you going to do with it? And what does it mean? We do a good job of not thinking about it because it's in many ways, it raises all kinds of very, very serious existential questions. Uh, these are the questions that I think are the most powerful questions that we, that we have to face. There are significant changes happening amongst the, the, the baby boomer generation. Uh, I just posted on the website yesterday, uh, on the Facebook part of the website, uh, a, a report from the CDC that came out last May that the greatest rise in suicides in the United States of America in the last 15 years has been amongst baby boomer men. And I don't understand why. Uh, the, the CDC, uh, this, pro, this report came out last May. At the same time, uh, those of you who read the Times, as, which as you know is the, the basic Jewish newspaper of America, um, about a year and a half ago had this very disturbing piece that one of the fastest growing rises in divorce is amongst baby boomers, the generation of baby boomers. And I think that has to do with a lot of the fact of this longevity issue, that um, the kids may leave our house if, when we're 55, 56, 60, and with several decades more of life, and with the buffer of those kids that have always been there, say, for 20-some years across the breakfast table gone, uh, a lot of men and women take a look at what was that, that partner across the table and say, you know, I have 25, 30 years, God willing, halavai of life. Is this, do I still want to stay this way? Or do I want, this is my last shot? Or what, and I, I'm, not a, I'm not an expert in this, although we are going to do a radio show on it, because it's so prevalent. And I've talked to enough therapists and marriage counselors and, and divorce lawyers and specifically asked them, are you seeing this trend? And each one of them in their own way have said, Absolutely. The world has significantly begun to change for us, as men especially. The impact of the feminist movement, you remember the, the, the Jewish feminist movement, and we'll just stick to our community, which really was born in the 70s and has significantly transformed the Judaism that exists now. Uh, my class of the Hebrew Union College, I was ordained in 1972 from the Hebrew Union College in Cincinnati, Ohio. We were the class that had Sally Presan in it. My class was probably the most historic class that ever graduated the Hebrew Union College. Sally was the first fully ordained rabbi recognized by It's a good song. Um, give it an 85, good beat, can dance to it. If you, can. If you remember. American, American Bandstand. How many of you came home from high school to watch American Bandstand? Right, right, because maybe once, once a Purim, there was a Jewish kid allowed on there. <laughs> were, you, were you American Bandstand? Once. Once, right. And then they said, no more. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the feminist movement, which, which, uh, really has impacted the role of men. And, and if, you, if you ask colleagues, rabbis, to be serious about the types of situations that they see within their offices in the last several years, the last couple of decades, you're going to see, if they're, if they're honest with you, um, this real impact on family systems and shifting roles about what it means to be a Jewish man married to um, women who are very, very career oriented. <coughs> And we transfer that to our own daughters, because our own daughters, I happen to have one, um, were raised with this idea, Liz was born in 1980, and she was raised full blown with this idea that she could be anything she wants, 
and there's nothing that she can't do. There are no glass ceilings available to her. And this also significantly has changed the dynamics of families in the, in the old 1950s roles. And I'm using this very, very, very quickly because we don't have a lot of time to unpack this. But a lot of you, I would bet, and I don't know most of you, but I would bet you my Phillies tickets, not that they're worth much anymore, um, <laughs> because they're only signing people my age. <laughs> I told somebody at one of our forums yesterday that most likely in the dugout this semester, this, semester, this year at Citizens Bank Ballpark, there'll probably be on one end of the dugout a, a, a case of insure, <laughs> and in the other end of the dugout a box of depends. <laughs> and a defibrillator in the middle? And a defibrillator in the middle, because God forbid they have to run around the bases. Um, <laughs> But we'll pray anyway, not that it makes any difference for him. So th this, this idea of the changing role of, of, of Jewish men going forward and, 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 and how that's being translated, and just think about our own children um, and the dynamics and how our, our kids' families are structured and how they're juggling certain things. The other, the other issue that, that, that is also quite prevalent with us now as baby boomer men is um, the stresses and strains of what's happening in our own family systems. One of the things that we do, in fact, we're, the next health and wellness forum at McCore that we're going to do in, on February 22nd is going to take a look at this whole issue of caregiving. Uh, here's an informal Richie address poll, not totally unscientific. There's one, two, three, four, five, six tables. There's about six people, so six times six is what? 30, about 36. So there's probably about 36 to 40 guys here. How many of you are or have been involved actively as caregivers? All right, so the majority of us, me included. The stresses and strains, the stresses and strains on a family psychologically, spiritually, and economically, for those of us who have done this, you know exactly what I'm talking about, um, are incalculable, and very few people are talking about it. This is linked to this other mythology uh, that we were, I think, fed when we were in college, in graduate school, that if you work real hard, you get to be 65, you can retire, everything's going to be wonderful, life is a dream. And for many people who, many men right now, 62, 65 years of age, they're working harder than they've ever worked before. And their stresses and strains are manifest in ways that were incalculable when we were trying to figure this out when we were in graduate school or in our starting our careers, let's say, in the 70s. Part of that is the caregiving issue. Part of it is the family dynamics issue. Part of that is the economic downturn which has affected many, many, many people in this community. All you have to do is line up every single rabbi in this community and ask them, have they seen men coming into their office and families dealing with the impact of the economic downturn? And I will bet you that the overwhelming majority of our colleagues will say yes. <coughs> these existential spiritual issues, these are major spiritual issues. And I'm going to suggest to you that they begin with this concept that is this gift of time. What are we going to do with this time? And the work I do with baby boomers, I cannot tell you how many times I've had this conversation with men uh, and women, but mostly men, in the last several years. They're 62, they're, six, they're 58, they're 65, and they're saying, I'm done with full-time work, but are there so many things that I want to do? I need to reinvent myself. How do I do that? Or with a couple of guys that were in my office this week. I've been laid off. My company downsized. I'm 58 years old. I'm young and vital. What do I do? How do I begin to reinvent myself because I'm not ready to go to Boca and play golf every day? God forbid. Not that there's anything wrong with golf or not that there's anything wrong with Boca. This raises, I'm going to suggest to you, the spiritual or existential question that I'm now convinced is the real issue for all of us. This is not easy stuff. And we spend most of our life running away from these questions because they're tough questions. But the gift of longevity has allowed us 
to ask what I call the why questions. The why questions come from my understanding of the, what I could, would suggest to you is the best chapter written in the Torah, Genesis chapter 3. Go home and read it. It'll take you five minutes to read it. There's nothing on TV today. There's no game. So what are you going to do? What? Go read Torah. What else is there to do? Genesis chapter 3 is the mythology of Adam and Eve. You know the story. You've probably seen the movie. And some of you even read the book. <laughs> and in that story is God's first question. Adam and Eve hide. They discover their nakedness. They've tasted knowledge. They understand who they are. And God roams the, the, the garden asking the first question that's raised by God in the Torah, Ayeka, where are you? And I suggest that that's the only question that really matters in life. And we're all at the age when that question is very, very profound. And that Ayeka question, which I, again, I'll submit to you, we spend most of our life trying to answer in one way, form, shape, or form or another, gives rise to what I call the why questions of existence. These are not easy questions, but I'm going to suggest to you, and you're free to reject it, these are the only questions that matter, and they matter more as we get older. Why was I born? Why must I die? Why am I here? Does my life have any meaning? Does my life have any purpose? Or am I just some cosmic accident of sperm and egg? Why was I born? Why must I die? Why am I here? I'm going to suggest to you that these are the only questions that matter. I'm also going to suggest to you these are the questions that gave rise to religion. That's why people invented religion to answer these questions. And we're still asking them. And I'm going to suggest to you that in the privacy of your own souls, in the quiet moments when you're just alone with yourself, when the craziness of the world is removed, and you begin to look at yourself in the mirror and say, where did my dad come from? And when you begin to look at your child, your grandchildren's eyes, and you realize that they are going to go to places where we can never go. We begin to ask ourselves, so what does this mean? What can I leave them so that they remember me with meaning and passion and love? I look at the prince and princess's eyes, otherwise known as Jacob and Ayla, who are basically perfect. <laughs> and I look at their eyes, and I look and try to contemplate the world. Ayla's going to be five, and Jacob's going to be two next month. And try to figure out the world that they are going to inherit. Some of you have seen this with your own grandchildren. And it is one way frightening on one way illuminating, and one way very, very sobering. Because here's a confession, because Yom Kippur is coming. I want to go there with them. I want to be there with them. And then, just like that, there's this unbelievable subconscious reality that is that I won't, I can't, I can never go where they're going. So time becomes even more precious. And with that time goes the last thing I want to just lay out for you this morning. And that is the power of being in relationship with other human beings. My own theology, and people from the core have heard this probably enough already, so uh, forgive me. My own theology I call the theology of relationships. It's very simple because I'm, I don't, I'm not very complicated. The theology of relationships is based upon a very simple premise that the most powerful thing in your life are the relationships that you have with other people. And we will do anything in our power 
to maintain those relationships. And by the way, that's why you're all here this morning. And it goes to a corollary of my understanding of Genesis 3. Because as we age, I'm going to suggest to you that the importance of relationships becomes even more important. Because there are two twin fears that we have. The twin fears come from my understanding of a great text, because everything I do is try to re 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 revert back to text, because I'm a rabbi, that's the ballpark I play in. Genesis 2.18, a great text. You all know this. It's where God and, a a and Adam are having a conversation. He, he, he's alone, and uh, they, God keeps bringing him things to make him comfortable and happy, and he finally says, no. <laughs> I don't want to snuggle up on a cold winter's night with a gorilla. Um, you, know, I, I, you have something better in mind. I mean, I'm paraphrasing Genesis 2. And on Genesis 2.18, he says, it is not good for human beings to be livado. This is a great Hebrew word. Livado means alone. My suggestion to you, it, it, it is not the alone that we sometimes, all of us, feel that we just had enough of everything we just need a timeout, an adult timeout. And like this afternoon, I'm going to go home. Hopefully, I have one more meeting to go to for the congregation. I have an afternoon and a night off. And I'm looking forward to going home and being alone. Jane's going to cook a nice dinner. And I'm just going to chill before the war starts tomorrow morning. OK? That's not the alone I'm talking about. I'm talking about this existential aloneness that some of us in this room have felt when we feel cut off from everything else and very much alone. Even if we're sitting in the middle of Citizens Bank Park with 47,000 people and we feel totally alone. Um, this livadonis um, is a very, very powerful emotion and a very powerful fear in all of us. It raises, and some of you have, some of us have walked this walk, because I walked it with my mom, and I think my dad, but I, I wasn't quite aware of it with my dad, because it was a different circumstance. If we're honest with each other, I'm going to suggest to you that, that, that there's two <coughs> real fears that we have about our own life ending. Again, these are not easy questions, especially for oh, it's another warm, beautiful Cherry Hill Sunday morning. Those two things are we fear ending our life in pain and suffering. Because some of us in this room have seen loved ones in their final years or moments in excruciating pain. And Judaism, by the way, tells us that that is not a Jewish way to end your life. And the other fear is the fear of being alone at the end of our life. Um, and that is a powerful, powerful fear. This concept of, of being alone, this live adonis, is met with the opposite emotional drive in each one of us. And this goes to our need to be in relationships with other people. And I think I'm going to suggest to you it goes as a foundation as how we choose to answer the why questions of existence. The why was I born? Why must I die? Why am I alive? And it goes to what I'm going to ask you to consider is the most basic, powerful emotion that each one of us have resting in our heart and soul that becomes more powerful as we grow older, and that is love. We need to be loved, and we want to love. And I'm not necessarily talking about romantic love, not to quote Rabbi Seinfeld that there's anything wrong with that. I'm talking about this need to be in relationships with other people, to have an intimate relationships with other human beings, to be felt to be, that we are needed, and to need to be needed. If you've read Heschel, and I suggest if you haven't, you should. We're going to be teaching a mini course at Heschel at McCor in March. He has this wonderful sentence in, uh, I forget the book, this idea, I think it's a man in search of God or God in search of man or searching, searching for something or other. I don't remember the name of the book. 
But Heschel, who writes poetry, literature, uh, uh, prose is poetry, really said that the most basic thing that each one of us have in us is this need to be needed. And that just as we need God, God needs us. God is in search of man as man is in search of God. That's a whole sermon for another time. But it goes to the idea that we need to be in relationship with other people, that we crave it. And that we will go, by the way, to those organizations, those institutions, those groups, those clubs, those gangs, those chevra that validate us and our humanity, even if it's the wrong place to go. You've seen kids. You may have had this conversation with our own kids and say that there's kids who may not sit at the cool table. Um, while I was running the department, we created this whole project for the movement on resilience. We call it resilience of the soul, because the original term that we create, came up with, people just reject it. It was a project on dealing with self-destructive behaviors, uh, cutting, suicide, uh, substance abuse, stuff that um, violence, domestic violence, uh, uh, dating violence, all the stuff that's happening with our kids at Cherry Hill East, Cherry Hill West, and all the high schools. That's a true statement of fact. And when we interviewed all these hundreds and hundreds of teenagers as we put this project together, one of the things that came up over and over and over again when we kept asking these kids, why, are you, why did you cut? Why are you cutting? Why, why were you constant? Why did you act out? Why? And an overwhelmingly answer came, it says, because I couldn't fit in with this group, but that group over there, they, they said, come, we'll be your friends. And I wanted to be there. I, I, needed a, I needed to be with other people. I mean, I'm simplifying something that's very, very complex. But if some of you have had or walked this experience personally or professionally, you know that I'm not that far off. So this need to be needed, this desire to be with other people, I think is such a profound emotional need in each one of us. And especially as we get older especially when we understand that the greater part of our lives is not ahead of us, which raises again the ante of those why's questions, the why questions. Why was I born? Why must I die? Why am I here? What legacy do I want to leave my children and grandchildren? What do I wish them to remember and how will I be remembered? We do not wish to be alone. We wish to be needed. We wish to be loved. And we wish to love. So just a few things to think about on your drive home, or perhaps as you call up people and ask them for money for the feds. Um, I thank you for your time. The cards for the. Uh, The Jewish Sacred Aging cards are in the back. Please take them. Go on the website. If you'd like to write for it, let me know. Tune in the radio show. And if you'd like to sponsor it, be my guest. Let me know. Yes, sir. I, I don't know what your protocol is for questions. OK, yes, sir. Thank you for your coming here today. Uh, I am one of those marriage counselors that did not ask. Oh, OK. Uh, Sorry. But, Give me uh, your card. I'll ask you. Actually, I think the idea that there's more divorce with the baby boomers. Yeah. Is, I think it's a little bit more simplistic. Based on my anecdotal experience, mm -hmm. we go through individually crisis, stages of crises, childhood, adolescence, adulthood, elder life. Mm -hmm. But we also go through stages of crisis in marriage. First child, change of job, retirement. And we find that the divorce rate increases with each one of those developmental stages. So yes, as time goes on, we have the last developmental stage, but the rate of divorce really starts at the most, most of us experience divorce with the birth of the first child. You know, I, what's your name? Ed. Ed. You know, I, 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 we didn't have time to unpack this whole thing, but I have this whole theory of self that I wrote about in Seekers of Meaning. And part of that is that what I call the R factor of life, which is what you described, and how people react to the R factor, which, is, which most people think of as bad stuff, like I got a bad diagnosis, 
But like you're alluding to, sometimes it's, you know, a, a couple will come to you and say, we have, my, my spouse just got this great job offer. It means that we have to uproot from Cherry Hill. We have to move to Seattle. And I don't know anybody in Seattle and all my support, and if he goes, it's going to really, and I'm not happy. And that, that, that good thing also creates stress and strain within a relationship that sometimes can lead to a, a, a breakup. I mean, that, the, that R, well, I call it the R factor, just because it's just easy for me to understand it. But you're right. I mean, the, the stresses and strains, and they seem to be heightened more. I don't, I don't know. You probably know it better than I. These stresses and strains and pivotal moments in life seem to be more exaggerated now and, and, and than, than ever before. Perhaps it's because of the breakdown in neighborhoods, uh, the mobility. People are scattered all over the world, all over the country. And the stresses and strains that, that in, uh, inherent to that seem to be greater. So uh, thank you for your comment. One of the things we're finding is um, perhaps because of the women's liberation movement and their ability to work, there's more opportunity for married women or married men to meet each other. So a huge amount of divorce right now is because of infidelity, right. mostly because of meeting in the workplace. Really? Yes, sir. Um, one element you didn't mention. Oh, I'm, sure, I'm sure there's a bunch. The new male regeneration. Yeah. Viagra. Oh, yeah, no, no, no. They, <laughs> well, you know, no, no, you, 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 it's not funny. I just posted on the Facebook page of my website the other day a report. <laughs> it, was, it was an article. I, 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 I forget where the article was. It may have been in the Times. Um, but the whole thing was that one of the great challenges of um, nursing homes, assisted living facilities, is this huge rise in um, sexually transmitted diseases. <laughs> was it time? Was in the Times? Oh, that's the op. That's right. The op-ed piece by Dr. Emanuel uh, last Sunday. Correct. Correct. You know, it's tough to pull stuff out anymore. Um, and that got an amazing response on the Facebook page. Um, and most people don't. Most people think we just about this with kids. But because of the little blue pill, you know, technology has changed a lot of stuff. And I, I rest, I'll just leave it there. <laughs> but you're absolutely right. And, and a lot of people don't want, when I was researching an article uh, about 10 years ago for our, our professional journal, the CCR Journal, I wrote this article called With Eyes Undimmed and Vigor Unabated, which is how Moses dies at the end of the book of Deuteronomy. Um, which is a text that a lot of rabbis don't quote. But now with Viagra, it's that a lot of their congregants are living that text in, in Deuteronomy. And what surprised me was I, I, I went and researched um, uh, nursing homes, one in New York, and then, one, and then the handmaker's the home in uh, Tucson, Arizona, J just, for the, just to give a you know, variety. And they both had codicils about um, the privacy, sexual privacy, that's protected when, for residents. And uh, that it's in these, you know, when, the, when you join, enter into these homes, it's in there that your, your sexual activity is protected. You're, this is a part of the life. And call it a vote. So yeah, it's, um, it's a very, it's a whole different war, a, a whole different ball game. But, and, 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 Part of the work that we do in, in my, the Sacred Aging Project and, the, and some of the baby boomer stuff it, in, on the website deals, deals with this. And it's there. And, and, and wait till the boomers get to be, you know, <laughs> that's in a whole other lecture for another time. <laughs> but you should put somebody in here to talk about that. Yes, Dave. Uh, can you just tell people about your radio show this Tuesday mornings? Some of the topics, the boomer topics. The radio show is called Boomer Generation Radio. It's, um, I didn't put them up to that. Um, it's on WWDB for the, for the next week. It's still only on one half hour from 10 to 10.30. The show streams live on the internet on WWDB. And then on my website, jewishsacredaging.com, we podcast it uh, and archive it on my website, usually by Thursday or Friday. The show is, is going OK. As of February 4th, it goes to one hour. Um, which is, gonna, is presenting me with how to fill that hour, although we have a nice sponsor and I'm looking for ideas. And if any of you have businesses and you'd like some free publicity and I, I'd like, a, like to do some giveaways and some stuff 
because an hour is a lot different than a half an hour. The, the, the last Tuesday show was I just interviewed on a very, very good interview. It's up on the web, my website now, Dr. Stephen Goldfein from Samaritan Hospice. And we talked about what hospice is, and we talked about what they do. Um, you know, the, the topics vary. Just this month, I had this woman, Simona Hadjajoris, who started this whole uh, nutrition and wellness program for baby boomers. Um, so, uh, uh, Bonnie Jaffe, who started this whole website called 50 and Beyond, she was on. Uh, we're having another uh, 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 woman um, who's, uh, 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 Roseanne. Roseanne is coming on in the middle of February. We're doing some stuff on drug, uh, a woman who heads a national drug issue coming up at the beginning of March on the challenge of dealing with our parents and overuse of drugs and how drugs are mixed. I ran into this with my mom, who would go to doctors and, and um, maybe that she would go to so many doctors that the doctor would give this prescription and the next doctor would give that prescription. And finally, a druggist that I went to fill one of these prescriptions said, you know, uh, Richard, that this drug that one doctor prescribed and that drug that the other don't necessarily get along with each other. And it was really impacting her health. And I would suggest that I'm running into that. And probably some of you have, may have run into that in caregiving. So um, I'm having the former president of um, the national organization that deals with collaborative divorce on in March. Um, so it, it is a lot of different. Um, Rick Moody was on in December, who we worked for AARP as uh, one of their chief um, educational advisors who talked about baby boomers in age. We're talking, we're talking about everything from medicine. I've had a, a Dr. Laskin on a lot of times. In December, that, stops, that program is still up. Uh, and when the statin report came out, I asked him to come on and say, what's the story with this statin thing? Because a lot of, a lot of, a lot of people our gen generation are on statins, and now the government is saying, no, 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 it's all wrong. So he gave a very, very reasoned and quiet response for about 15 minutes on that report and what it means. So it, it's a, it, it varies. And if any of you have any suggestions or are involved in something you'd like to be on or help out, let me know. The man is standing right next to me, so that's probably a subtle but effective hit to shut up. So thank you. Have, have, uh, stay warm. Rabbi, thank you so much. Thank you. Rabbi, before you go, I, I'd like to give you this. He's going to take a picture. Oh. You know. Oh my God! Well, you want to give me that? Yeah, uh, give you that, so maybe we can. Oh, uh, thank you. Like the Oscars. All right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> or, the, or, or the Grammys. Except, except you don't get to make a speech. Yeah. <laughs> I also don't get to have Amy Adams in front of me. Yeah. Well, I, I never get that. But Rabbi, thank uh, you for. Look around. Thank you for a, a very informative presentation. Um, we really appreciate it. One of the things you were talking about is why you are here. And in addition to giving us a very thought-provoking. Uh, speech, you are also here to draw our 50 50. Okay, I have to do this here because I have to get to a meeting for the congregation. <laughs> so if you'll reach in minutes. that bag, that's all we need you we to must do. Have had the high rollers here this morning at $64.28 oh, uh, was collected. Oh, I think it's the very biggest since I've been treasurer. Six one oh one. Oh, 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 that, no, we got that's one there. The one. Sorry, this is the loser. <laughs> our 50 50 winner, 4 2 6 6 8. Three four. Four two six eight three four. Ah oh, man! All right. All right. And just a couple of other things, guys, real quick. As a follow-up to our speaker, I think last month from the JFCS, Dave Schwartz has volunteered to serve as a liaison for us to that group. So Dave, is there anything that you needed to mention? Okay. Joel, again, thanks for joining us. I hope you become a member. Uh, Art, Vestman Club, immediately after the meeting. Bob and others that are going to help downstairs, please do so. And please return, if you borrowed a shirt, if you borrowed a shirt, please return it to that table. <laughs>